Hi, this is Lucy Kang, one of the Making Contact producers, and we have some exciting news to share with you. We've changed the name of our umbrella organization, formerly known as the National Radio Project. It's now Frequencies of Change Media, or FOC Media for short. Why the change? Well, it's simple. While our roots remain firmly planted in audio storytelling, those captivating radio stories and thought-provoking interviews you've come to love, we've also blossomed into something more. And it's time to change our name to reflect that. Frequencies of Change Media now encompasses our broader mission to champion fiercely independent voices and narratives through education and fiscal sponsorship. Though we have a new name, our heart's still the same. Our weekly show, Making Contact, isn't going anywhere. It's still the same beacon of radical, nuanced reporting committed to amplifying stories that matter. So visit our new website at focmedia.org, sign up for our newsletter, learn about our team, get in-depth background on some of our stories, and if you can, make a monthly donation so we can continue our mission to use audio storytelling to inspire a more just world. Thank you for being a part of our community and our journey. Our system is in too many ways broken. The way we see the world shapes the way that we treat it. This is Making Contact. As voters enter an election year, many feel that democracy itself is in jeopardy. A new report from the Brennan Center for Justice finds that voters in 27 states will face restrictions in the 2024 elections, unlike anything they've experienced in an election before. The report also finds that legislators in at least 13 states have introduced 41 bills that would create new voting obstacles. Some bills would allow citizens to initiate post-election audits. Others would impose harsher criminal penalties on election workers for making unintended errors. Many of them give partisan actors more influence, and if passed, these laws would disproportionately impact voters of color, specifically black and brown folks. There are laws that are being put in place to take us back to a time when voting was very, very difficult. We would love for you all to, one, really share about some of the issues that are going on in your community. Why is this election important? Why is it important that South Georgia is not left out of process? Because you ain't, because black voters matter. Everyone should matter, but we don't, as black Americans don't matter. And it's unfortunate that it has to be that way in a country that's supposed to be a free country. This country is in a state of democratic crisis. There's various ways that uh, governments are now trying to suppress the vote. And one of them is uh, a long line keeping people from voting. There's too many efforts here to take away our rights and to take history backwards. And I'm angered by it. I'm really surprised at myself that I stayed in the line. Because when I was at the end of it, or at the back of it, I actually wanted to get back in my car. Atlanta has long stood out as a dynamic city in the South, with its robust Black middle class, booming business sector, and concentration of Black colleges. It's hard to conceive that Atlanta exists in the heart of Georgia, home to the KKK and Confederate Southern pride. City of Atlanta has been popularized, I think, in the last 60 years or so, and maybe as even almost 70 years, as a very progressive Southern city. And that unlike Jackson or Memphis or even Little Rock, Arkansas, 1957, Little Rock 9, that Atlanta has been more progressive and has been able to avoid some of the hot flashes of great hostility and resistance to civil rights, democracy, and equality of before the law. In his book, America's Black Capital, How African Americans Remade Atlanta in the Shadow of the Confederacy, acclaimed author and historian Jeffrey O.G. Oakbar explores the rise and persistence of white nationalism against the backdrop of Black political engagement in the state of Georgia. If you look at the actual data and look at the numbers and you look at um, what cities desegregated buses or what cities desegregated schools or hotels 
or just public accommodations in general, or what cities uh, have more terrorist activity, more explicit white supremacist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan, Atlanta is that city. It outperforms by every single metric, uh, every other city in the South, <laughs> by all those standards, which is always surprising to people when you explain that there were more terrorist bombings in Atlanta than Birmingham, Alabama during the Black Freedom Movement, that the Klan, when it reached this apogee of activity in the 1920s, and it was headquartered in the South with 4 million members across the country, it wasn't headquartered in Memphis or New Orleans or Charleston or uh, Jackson, Mississippi, but it was headquartered in Atlanta. You know, the mayor was a Klansman. Police officers were Klansmen. Uh, the congressional delegation had three Klansmen, open Klansmen, too. They weren't Klan and signed about it. And so what I've always found very surprising is that the political power, social economic power in Atlanta has been firmly in the hands of virulent white nationalists for so long that African Americans in the city were forced to create institutions for and about their survival in ways that other cities had to, but other cities didn't have the highest concentration of black colleges and universities or, or, or a high concentration of black colleges and universities. So there are so many schools in Atlanta, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark, Morris Brown, uh, Gamma Theological Seminary, that these schools were important incubators for black leadership. What other, you know, there were a number of interesting people uh, that are presented in the book. Two characters in particular were Clark Howe and Hulk Smith uh, in the 19th mm -hmm. century. What's their significance in the larger historical conversation of black disenfranchisement and undermining democracy? Wow. Well, yeah, you. I, I really like that question. That's a fantastic question. That, that's that's um, one of the best questions I've heard in any interview. Clark Howell and Hoke Smith ran for the governorship of Georgia in 1906. And one was supported by the Atlanta Journal. One was supported by the Atlanta Constitution. Those are the two major newspapers in Atlanta. And the two papers today are combined, the Atlanta Journal Constitution is called. And the, they use the two papers to promote their um, their political platforms. And they argued both that they were a bigger racist than the other guy or a bigger white supremacist than the other guy. And they were like, and back then you could, they didn't have to use dog whistle politics. They could just be open. They're like, I hate N words. I want white supremacy. And they were very clear about it. So you can read the papers and they just are like, how can we disenfranchise the Negro? <laughs> and so each man claimed that he was more effective in eliminating the black vote than the other guy. And so they had to come up with a platform to, and they, they were running for the Democratic primary in the state. And so they were like, they were, and there were other guys in the race, but these were the two major ones. And so they said, hey, uh, one guy said, I will eliminate the black vote by um, creating a constitutional amendment, eliminating the vote altogether. And another guy said, well, you know, I will do it by having literacy tests. And the other dude said, well, if we have the literacy test, we will eliminate a whole bunch of white people the way it happened in Virginia. And literally saying, one guy at least was saying that this literacy test will support black people and undermine whites. Ultimately, they had to convince, they had to pander to ignorance and fear of the white voters. And they had to convince through ignorance and fear uh, white voters that that black people were a fundamental threat to democracy and to white supremacy in Georgia. So one argument was that they were idle, shiftless, lazy, and childlike and cannot make wise political choices and therefore were a threat that could be easily bought and corrupted and therefore uh, should be eliminated from the political process. Another argument, and this is a, this is confounding to perhaps a lot of listeners here, another argument, and they vacillated, two candidates vacillated between these two positions here. Another argument was that Black people were too aspirational, too industrious, too politically cunning, and that their ambition will undermine the racial order, and then Black people will be put on top. Hoke Smith, the former publisher of the Atlanta Journal, and Clark Howe, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, were exploring their news platforms to promote themselves while running for governor. Both newspapers sparked anger and hatred among its white readers, with stories playing to their fears. These sensationalist stories created such a tense environment that by late September, citywide violence erupted in the streets, with white mobs vandalizing Black-owned businesses, assaulting hundreds, and killing 25 African Americans during the four days of racial violence. This day in Georgia's history will later come to be known as the Atlanta Race Massacre, seen as a direct result of the election. In September of 1906, 
we had a series of uh, reports in the white press that black people have been attacking white women and uh, girls. They uh, whites poured out into the streets and started murdering black people. And you had a and many people ask, like, why didn't Atlanta have a Tulsa? But Atlanta did. And that was Atlanta's Tulsa. So 1906 race massacre happened in September um, in 1906 and mobs of uh, hordes of thugs and hoodlums poured out into the street, attacking people, pulling people from streetcars, burning black businesses. Um, hoodlums uh, went into people's homes, kicked in doors. Uh, black people were hanged from lampposts. Uh, businesses were burned and destroyed. And um, the city ended up being um, in a civil collapse for uh, about two or three days. Uh, the state militia had to come in and restore sort of order, if you will. But in the process, they uh, brutalized black people as well. It was an all white state of state militia. And they sided with the thugs and barbarians who were running through the street, uh, destroying and causing um, chaos and uh, violence. So it was a very harrowing uh, three days. And it went down as a, 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 a turning point in black Atlanta and white Atlanta in many ways, too. There were whites in the city who came out and uh, tried to protect their black friends, and there are cases of white bravery. Uh, what's also surprising to a lot of people is that you have cases of uh, the most elite, aristocratic black people that you've ever seen. Like you see those old 19th century photos or early 20th century Victorian old elite black folks. Those people, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Walter White, who became called Mr. NAACP, uh, the first black president of Morehouse College, John Hope, his wife, Regina uh, Burns Hope, they actually had guns. They passed guns out to black people. And many of us see this famous picture of Malcolm X with a gun peering through the his assault rifle peering uh, through a window. But um, Du Bois, who was ironically or, or coincidentally at the same age as Malcolm in that photo, about 38 years old, uh, du Bois had his own, He, as he said, he had a double barrel Winchester shotgun on my porch with shells waiting to pass, blow the guts of a terrorist on my front lawn if they came to murder my family. Status, education, and prominence did not shield W.E.B. Du Bois from the risk of violence. As segregation tightened its grip across the nation, many African Americans developed an understanding and practice of armed self-resistance in an attempt to protect themselves from white Southern authorities and terrorist organizations. The New York Times reported how shocked they were to see so many armed African Americans, and that the image of Black people, the only images that white Americans had of Black people were servile, cowardly, minstrel coons. That's all the images they had. They had nothing other, other than that in the dominant expression of Blackness in pop culture in the United States. Yet, in 1906, the New York Times reported that 300 Black men were marched off and stripped of their guns, and that Black men had been defending themselves, and they, and they according to New York Times, they took it a solid way. And they joked at the fear of the whites because they had armed themselves, uh, defended their community the way they did. And they were marched with state militia, 300 men, uh, gunpoint with machine guns at them. They marched them, arrested them and took them downtown because they were defending themselves against terrorists. But this is a really powerful scene. In many ways, it's been overlooked in the national discourse. I mean, I've never met anybody in Atlanta who does not know about the Atlanta Race Massacre of 1906. I'm sure there are people who there who don't know about it, but it's not something that's a secret in Atlanta. But on a national scale, very few people are aware of it. Uh, what two political figures in the 21st century uh, that would best represent a similar dog whistle mindset of Howe and Smith? You know, because I think it's important to connect mm. the dots for folks. Clark and Hope were very polarizing figures, but we still have that even now in today's time. If you look at uh, modern iterations of this uh, this effort to appeal to the most um, base elements of humanity, right? Ignorance and fear, and people who traffic in ignorance and fear in order to win election. Not sort of aspirational, not hopeful, not saying what I can do uh, for you, but what I can do to eliminate them or you know destabilize them or uh, neutralize the threat of them. And I think that um, in terms of the national election, Trump is the closest who comes to mind. You know, he came out in 2016 by saying that. You know, Mexico is sending, you know, rapists and drug dealers and they're worse. When do we beat Mexico at the border? They're laughing at us, at our stupidity. And now they're beating us economically. They are not our friend, believe me. But they're killing us economically. The U.S. has become a dumping ground 
for everybody else's problems. <laughs> Thank you. It's true. And these are the best and the finest. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems with us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. But I speak to border guards, and they tell us what we're getting. And it only makes common sense. They're sending us not the right people. It's coming from more than Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America, and it's got to stop. And it's got to stop fast. So there's a threat of them, you know. And then you have him referring to immigrants from these other countries. And uh, he had a speech we talked about their um, polluting our blood, right? And that these people, and he named uh, people from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, right? He didn't, he named these continents and he made a point not to name Europe. And so he's very clear with dog whistle politics in the same sort of way that we might see uh, Clark Howell and Hoke Smith in 1906. And this is very unfortunate. And I think that the base, you have people who are, again, hostile to fairness and democracy. And I'm not sure how curious they are about a world beyond their narrow, myopic points of information. Clark Howe and Hoke Smith can be considered the early pioneers of racist dog whistle politics, known for invoking racial appeals to persuade white voters to support policies that may threaten their own interests and American democracy. It's a long political tradition of loaded rhetoric, be it promises to crack down on crime, restrict access to public aid programs, and the protection of American purity through the restriction of non-European immigrants. Simply put, the minority is the problem, which is problematic because it limits one's ability to critically see the commonality and struggle and the connections between the political agendas they support. But this, too, is an old narrative. I asked Professor Obar to share with me the story of Tom Watson. Watson, an early figure in American history who urged poor whites to not be fooled by plutocrats and politicians. Instead, he asked them to recognize the economic hardship and political marginalization shared by both blacks and whites. There are a number of people that come up in the book, a lot of fascinating characters. And one person I was familiar with before I began the research was a, a white Georgian guy named Tom Watson. Tom Watson in the 19th century was a lawyer. His father served in the Confederacy and was killed. He was a successful guy who looked around Atlanta and looked around Georgia in the late 19th century and saw that poor people, whites and blacks, were being exploited by the same class of exploiters. And he said that, I'm paraphrasing him here, he said that imagine an arch that is that supports your oppression and your poverty and your economic, social, political marginalization. He told poor people, white and black, the keystone to that arch is racism, right? And the term racism didn't exist to be said, uh, racial hatred or something to that extent. So he said that racism supported your oppression, white guys, and that you may be barefoot, you could be broke down, you'd be illiterate, you might be um, unable to provide for your family, but you believe that some rich guy who is creating policies for other rich guys will benefit you because you see yourself in him, not the people who share your economic lot. And you can all benefit by having labor reform, by having uh, child welfare reform, educational reform. And he talked about all these reforms and the taxes on these big corporations that are exploiting everyone. But at the end of the day, their fidelity to white nationalism uh, one out. And so at the end of the day, they got nothing from it other than what Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, famous historian, said, the psychological wages of whiteness. So they might still go back to their little hobble, a little hut, a little shack, no health care, no education, but they psychologically feel themselves tethered to the elite whites and therefore have a psychological wage. That's what Du Bois talks about. So we do see a, definitely a theme of that running through politics presently. Tom Watson's political thought is still being debated today. He's viewed as a complicated Georgia figure that cannot be put in a box. In the start of his career, he was labeled a liberal, especially for his time. But later in life, Watson stepped away from his liberal beliefs. By 1904, resentful of the manipulation of Black voters by Southern whites, 
which resulted in many failed political campaigns for him. And with the growing influence of black leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois, Watson became a staunch supporter of white supremacy. Even though Tom Watson lived more than 100 years ago, Dr. Obar points out that in Georgia, white nationalism is still very much alive, but the strategies to impede the black vote have evolved with the times. So I always think that at the end of the day, to your earlier question about what Atlanta demonstrates to the possibilities of the United States is the possibility of a huge turnout. And I, and I will say this, Anita Johnson, and I will say this, right now, there are people working overtime under the cloak of being super woke black people. And they're like, okay, we need to convince black people not to turn out. So we can create voter suppression laws. We can criminalize giving an old woman water who's standing in line. But what we need to do is convince black people that their vote does not count. We need to get super woke black people or people who pretend to be super woke black people to go online and tell black folks that there's no difference between the parties and the best way to demonstrate their political power is not voting. For decades, the Black community has been a loyal voting bloc for Democrats. But with recent polls citing Black voter disillusionment, some Black folks are discussing abandoning the political process altogether in order to make a political statement that the Black vote won't be taken for granted. I think right now we're going to be confronted with a, a group of people who will continue to assault us with information about how we need to not vote. And 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 the congressional uh, bipartisan investigations on uh, Russian meddling in the 2016 election found that Russians spent more money targeting one demographic group in the United States to suppress their vote. And that was African-Americans because African-Americans were voted against Trump. And they did that. And, and people were like, well, and so I think this is what this is. This is a fact of the matter. That voter suppression takes many forms, and one of the forms is to convince Black people that their vote. I always tell that their vote doesn't matter. I always tell people that if your votes didn't matter, then Fannie Lou Hamer wouldn't have been picked up and tortured and put in jail, right? If your votes didn't matter, they wouldn't have been blowing up people in churches, little Black kids in churches, and hanging people from trees. If your votes didn't matter, they wouldn't have spent hundreds of millions of man hours over the course of you know 400 years to prevent your your ancestors from voting, right? The voting clearly matters. <laughs> They want you to think so, and this is their latest ruse. What do you see as the three biggest threats moving into the 2024 election? Well, I do think that you have belligerent, ignorant, hateful rhetoric coming out of the Trump camp. I've not seen in any way uh, people who have, and, and, and I've been around, I'm a historian, I've not known people who've stormed buildings and let alone the federal capital, and trying to undermine the election and create a, a coup. And of course, they will say that Trump won, but members of their own party are quick to say all across the United States, uh, from Georgia to Michigan and Arizona, re elected Republicans themselves said that the election was fair. There was no widespread uh, voter fraud, and Trump lost. And Trump's advisors said that he lost. They told him that he lost. Bill Barr, his attorney general, told him he lost. And Bill Barr left rather than be part of this whole thing. And there are people who ideologically I find repugnant, but they understand the utility of the law and elections. And as much as I might have found someone like uh, George Herbert Walker Bush anathema to my beliefs, when he lost the election, he didn't go out like Trump. He didn't go out like Bashir al-Assad in Syria or Mubarak in Egypt or Mugabe or uh, Papa Dot, or Marcos, or Pinochet. I could go, or Tito, right? I could go to a whole list of, of, or Hitler, or Stalin, or somebody, right? I, I go to the whole list of people who have dismissed the democratic process because they want to stay in power, and they will run the country in the ground otherwise. Trump is not cut from the same cloth as typical politicians. Trump is, again, like Bashar al-Assad of Syria, is like, I will tear this MF down if I don't stay in power. And that's a fundamental danger. That's different than what we've dealt with before, you know? And that, I think, is a fundamental threat to the American Republic in a way that even Republicans who are not running for re-election, all of them, almost all of them, are like Trump is an existential danger to the American Republic. And, and I, that's the thing that I try to explain to people why 
you know, people are like, there's no difference. I mean, obviously, the Supreme Court demonstrates more starkly than anything else in the last few years what a difference is between these parties. But also, we have to disrupt this idea that we only vote for an ideologically pure position, that somehow, if you are not ideologically pure, I will not support you. And that's a, and that's a, a that's a guaranteed way to lose an election every single time if you ever take that position. And as much as I would love someone to be more progressive or more radical or more this, more that, at the end of the day, I know there are two options and one person will give much more to my community than the other or a little bit more than a community other or do less damage than the other. And I don't take loss of life lightly, right? So if, if it comes down to it, I will vote for the one that will benefit my community more than the other is a very clear issue for me. And I don't understand this position of trying to say that uh, white supremacists were what right, black people should not vote. I will not side with white supremacists who said that black people should just stay at home and not vote. But there's some people who want to do that. That's on them. Playing devil's advocate and not letting what you just said go over people's heads. I've heard this before. Some people say it's a conspiracy theory. People are crying wolf. But you're suggesting, if I understand correctly, that our democracy is in jeopardy because we're dealing with someone, meaning Trump, who could exist in a space like other dictators that have just decided to sit in the seat, that he would be, if given the opportunity, he would put into place ways that he could not be removed or he would create an atmosphere that might create what we saw when he was ousted or forced to leave the presidential office. So let's look at the world right now. We have two world leaders, Putin and Xi Jinping, both in while they were president in China and Russia, have modified their constitution so they can stay in office longer. That's now. I, I don't know if people thought, oh, Putin can do this. That's impossible. Oh, uh, Xi Jinping can do this. That's impossible. I don't know if they were having those conversations those other, pla other places. But in our lifetime, right now, that's happened. I don't see how the United States would be different. Um, I'm sure there are people in 1860 when Lincoln got elected, like, oh, no, civil war can't happen. No, that's not. This is the United States. And, of course, more Americans got killed in that conflict than wars combined, right? 700,000 Americans dead four years later. I think that a lot of times people think of themselves as somehow special and not prone to the predilections of other places that are not somehow as evolved. But time and again, we found ourselves in positions where we have been surprised by our capacity to go off path. And I don't think that many people have thought that you have had a president who will refuse to recognize that he lost, even when his closest advisors told him he lost, and even when his own vice president told him he lost, and even when his attorney general told him he lost. And I, I don't think that we have thought that we have seen a president who will then inspire a mob of thugs to run up into the Capitol. And literally, these people are chanting, hang Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States, because he didn't try to support a coup. And that even when people were calling the president of the United States, telling him to, to nationalize troops and send them out to protect these lawmakers, that he refused to for hours, right? I don't, I don't know if people would have thought that three years earlier. And even now, half of Americans, if not slightly more, are willing to put that same man back in power. And it shows you the degree to which there are certain people who find democracy inconvenient when its results are not what they wanted it to be. And this is a, this is very frightening to me, you know, I mean, because... Anything can happen, right? And that this is this is really this is very frightening. And I think that there's no way to ignore the fact that Trump is this fundamental threat. And you know, people can say what they want to say about um, you know Biden. And the, the thing is, I find crazy that people like John Bolton, you know, these people who are hardcore right wing uh, Republicans, who uh, are explaining how much of a fundamental threat Trump is. I mean, and you don't have anything like this in the Democratic Party. As much as people might not be super enthusiastic about Biden. At the end of the day, he's not a fundamental threat to America, a very different landscape. You do not have people who work closely with Biden who are coming out saying that this man is a fundamental threat to America. You have that with Trump in spades. Whether you agree with Dr. Ogbar or not, one thing is clear. The stakes are high this election year. I'm Anita Johnson, and this is Making Contact. 
I spoke with the University of Connecticut historian Jeffrey O.G. Ogbar, Ph.D., about his book, America's Black Capital, How African Americans Remade Atlanta in the Shadow of the Confederacy. If you want to check out the book, visit us at focmedia.org. That's F-O-C-media.org. Thank you for listening to Making Contact.